when I was just in high school, I knew that I wanted to be a CEO. So I was very lucky. Um, most, most people when they're young just they have no clue at all. I'd say the last 10 years it's gotten particularly stressful for CEOs because you're barraged with all of these societal issues that I, they, they sound important. The foundational change that AI is going to have on the society over the yeah. next 10 or 20 years. And I, you know, that's one of the keynotes I love to give is you know, the business impact of AI. And I it says this is going to be one of the biggest things ever. And one thing I tell all CEOs is like, think about your business in the limit, in the limit of success. Like what happens to the world? I'm like massive worldwide inefficiency that just bugged me. And email is yeah. one. The average person spends about three to four hours in their email a day in business. And their average typing speed is around. So one, one comment is every business that's at a different life cycle has a very different need for leadership in terms of like what the business needs and how you operate it. Yeah, you know, world-class companies are like Amazon and Apple. These guys operate in the world of 80 plus net promoter. Yeah, you know, I'd say, and I'd say a lot of people are in this boat now. They're balancing these three stakeholders, which is freaking hard work. Just, just balancing three. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Leadership Talks, where we delve into the journeys and insights of today's most inspiring leaders. I'm your host, Martin Rovinsky, CEO of Boardzai, and today we have a pleasure of speaking with Victor Cho, a seasoned CEO, advisor, and board member with a deep passion for creating exceptional online customer experiences. Victor is known for his leadership grounded in transparency empathy, diversity, and integrity. He has a remarkable track record of driving businesses, transformations, and advocating for a four stakeholder focus, ensuring companies are accountable to employees, customers, shareholders, and society at large. Join us as we explore Victor's journey and his unique approach to leadership and innovation. Welcome, Victor. Martin, such a pleasure. Pleasure to be here. Awesome. I'm so excited. Uh, obviously, I, I uh, dived into your LinkedIn and your experience and overwhelming. No, no, um, it's not, no I'm embarrassed after you were reading that. I'm like, wait. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, you started obviously as a uh, entrepreneur. You were doing some consulting, but then you just had a spike. I mean, Kodak, Lord, Lord, Microsoft and on and on. How did your journey begin? Like, what was your leadership style back then versus now? How did you grow? Yeah, so you know, it's funny. I was a I was a weird kid, and that when I was just in high school, I knew that I wanted to be a CEO. So I was very lucky. Um, most most people when they're young just they have like no clue at all <laughs> what they want to go do, <laughs> uh, and I didn't even know it was called a CEO because I did I didn't uh, I grew up with like very humble means. Uh, but I, my favorite book was Lord of the Rings. And in that book, it was clear to me, like, I loved the strategy involved in like the battle scenes that always, I was like, oh, that's so cool. Like to, to mobilize resources and try to do something like I want to be the general. So I wanted to be like the general of computers. Cause the other thing that happened, uh, and this is a lot, yeah, cause I'm super old, but, uh, the personal computer basically showed up when I was in high school, uh, junior high school. And I managed to get my hands on one. I was like, oh my god, this is the most amazing thing on the planet. So that was it. I was like, I want to be the I want to be the general of computers. It wasn't until uh, college that I figured out, you know, that was called the CEO. But no, in terms of my journey, I, I'd say it, it was it. You know, my leadership style, of course, evolved over the years. At every company, I yeah, I think you pick up something, you take a little bit of it with you, uh, kind of rounds out your toolkit. Um, but my I say my most formative leadership experiences were i'd say earlier on they were at microsoft for sure which was one of my first corporate experiences uh, and and intuit was another really big one i'd yeah you know, i'd say if i just grabbed those two then you know, i probably you're probably getting 90 percent of what i am today <laughs> <laughs> and obviously i'm gonna take a wild guess uh jeffrey connection came from uh when you were at kodak that's right. Yes. Yes. Uh, good friend, Jeff Hazlett. He was the CMO there. I had just taken my first CEO role. Um, you know, Kodak was interesting because I joined, I joined them when they were going through their huge turnaround. So it was a, and then I was, I was running their online business, which was also in need of a turnaround. So it was, a, it was a double turnaround, which was by design. Cause at, you know, at that point in time, I actually hadn't yeah. experienced what a turnaround was like. And I wanted to understand, uh, kind of, you know, 
what, what is it like to run a business that needs turnaround? And yeah, no, he, he and I hit it off and uh, he, he was one of my favorite folks <laughs> over at Kodak by far. He's a great guy. Yeah. He's a great guy for sure. Um, since you brought up turnaround, you've successfully led major turnarounds at companies like not only Kodak, but also Evite. What are some of the biggest challenges you faced during these transformations and how did you leverage analytics, network business models, and recursive leadership engines to overcome them? Yeah, so turnarounds are a very strange animal. Um, you know, it's funny. So, uh, you know, going back to my first comment, of I knew that I wanted to run and be a CEO. Uh, my my leadership journey, my learning journey, was all about finding learning opportunities. So, what that means is, I, I never went for a title or a salary. Uh, I always just looked for where am I going to get the most interesting learning? And so I did big company, small company, startup. Uh, as I mentioned, right when when uh, when recruiters came and brought me the Kodak opportunity, I was like, ah, oh, tur- turnaround is is important, right? I've, I haven't experienced that. And so one one comment is every business that's at a different life cycle has a very different need for leadership uh, in terms of like what the business needs and how you operate it. And it was one of my key epiphanies is like a lot of a lot of executives have one toolkit, maybe they've been at one place, they've seen a hyper growth company, right? And now they try to apply that everywhere. And that's like, well, no, you know what? It's you're you're in a completely different environment when your stock is you know, decelerating and people are scared and it's like, you know, how you manage and mobilize folks, you know, can radically change. So I'd say that, you know, going back to your questions, yeah, maybe I'll just pick one or two key learnings. Um, one big one that was clear to me is most, most entrepreneurs are kind of optimistic. Most leaders, I think, are fairly optimistic, right? And so they want to come in and they put their plans in place and they're like, no, this is going to turn the ship around. And then they'll build a plan based on that success. So Kodak, as an example, right? Kodak had a brilliant plan to diversify its business, right? Because film was going away and right? it was going to launch entire new business lines. The, the people that came in to help turn Kodak around had built the HP printer business. And uh, I don't know if, uh, for folks that are not familiar, the HP printer business was probably one of the top five most profitable, fastest growing businesses ever created <laughs> at the time, right? So these are no, these are no slouches, right? I mean, and yeah. they had a great plan. They're like, hey, we've got all this technology, right? We understand, you know, ink, et cetera. And so, you know, they built their plan with the assumption of growth, but that growth just didn't come fast enough. And so the, the business got stuck in a cycle where it just had to continually reset and reset and that was just so demoralizing for the employees because it was just a never-ending constriction Um, in retrospect what would have been much more effective uh, and i've seen ceos that do this um, is you come in and you just you you build for the worst case scenario and you assume that your plan's not going to work but that you're still in good shape and that you don't have to keep Uh, cutting and decreasing. So, so that, that was one key learning, right? Is, is build for the most pessimistic version of the plan, which is which is really hard. But you're going to go through that pain anyway. You know, wor- worst case, you've yeah. you've overcut and you just get to hire people back faster. But that's way better than a perpetual cycle of of downsizing. Yeah. So there's, you know, there's there's a couple of nuggets I think in there. Don't don't be so optimistic about your <laughs> about your plans <laughs> until they actually happen. Be a little bit more realistic. Yeah, yeah. No, even pe- even pessimistic, right? I say, <laughs> even pessimistic. I'd say, yeah, yeah. No, I get it. You've also been very instrumental in creating online customer experiences uh, that truly delight users. Can you share some key strategies or principles that have guided you in achieving such high levels of customer satisfaction, especially with like a uh, uh, net promoter score of 80 80 plus yeah now so for uh, for those listeners that aren't familiar net promoter is probably considered one it's one of the best at least from my perspective one of the best measures of customer experience whether you're delivering you know a really delightful um, experience and just two seconds of background the way you calculate it is you I, i'm sure people have seen this question on a gazillion websites right it's like would you recommend this product or service to a friend so it's a very simple question uh, and you take the people that answer that on nine or ten, which are called your promoters, and you subtract out the people that score a zero through six, which are called your detractors. Uh, and then you come up with you you end up with a score somewhere between negative hundred and positive hundred, right? So for you, for you to get a positive hundred, you know, if you think through that math, 
That means 100% of people need to rate you a nine or 10, and nobody has rated you a zero through six in terms of recommendation. Pretty much impossible. So it's very hard, but you know, world-class companies are like Amazon and Apple. These guys operate in the world of 80 plus net promoter. Uh, and I was, uh, I, was, I was blessed. I got to work a little bit with, uh, with the founder of that, Fred Reichelt, early on. And so I've, I've always deployed that at my companies. And yeah, my, my goal was to get it up to 80, which takes so much effort and so much time, but the engine in some ways is very simple. Um, it's you know, it, at the core of it, you just have to talk to and listen to your customers and understand, well, what's, cr- for the people that have a nine or 10, like what's creating that amazing experience for them? And let's double down and triple down and find more things like that. And this is the hard part for all of the zero through sixes, because most, for most businesses, when you start, You've got like a negative net promoter. You've got all these people in the zero through six. And it's like, well, what's wrong? And the list of things that's wrong is like a hundred things, 500 things. And you're like, oh God, do I, you know, I, I want to go build the shiny new thing. I don't want to go fix that piece of the form that's broken. <laughs> um, and so it takes diligence to like, you really have to do embrace that mindset of no, you can't have these horrible experiences, that, even though they're not sexy, like you got to fix those detraction points. And so uh, Evite's a great example. When I first joined Evite, uh, that's one of the first things we did is we d- deployed Net Promoter. It actually had an okay Net Promoter for in some areas. Um, some products had a negative score, and but that was that was literally the thing that stabilized the business for us over about two years. Is we just slogged away at that list of three hundred, th- you know, four hundred things. Um, it's like, oh well, your mobile website doesn't work. I'm like, okay, yeah, well, we got to go fix that. And it's like six months later, okay, now what's yeah, now what do we do? Oh, your mobile apps what's don't next? work. <laughs> I was like, when do we get to go build this the exciting thing? It's like, no, no, you just got to, you got to fix that. You got to fix the basics. Yeah, that, that's the balance, right? You got a list of new tools you want to deploy, but got to concentrate on what's not working. Mm-hmm. It's always a tough balance. Um, let's talk real quick about the four stakeholder focus, uh, ensuring companies and accountable to employees, customers, shareholders, and society at large. How do you balance these sometimes competing interests and can you provide an example of how this approach has benefited a company you've led yeah so so the, the framework at a high level uh, i'm a big framework guy uh, and i've actually for the last couple of decades i've published uh just for like open source um creative commons license a, a whole bunch of my foundational frameworks for managing and running businesses so those are all up on my website uh, but but i find framework super super valuable in, in taking the complexity of the world and making it like a little bit more actionable. And so this fourth framework, this fourth stakeholder framework that you described is something that um, kind of came to me over the, la- over the last, I don't know, five or six years. And I really codified it in 2022. Um, and the gap that I was addressing was at that point in time, I could see you know, all of my CEO, you know, my fellow CEOs managing their businesses. They were, they were starting to, in general, they were starting to take what I'd call a balanced stakeholder view of running their businesses, meaning they weren't just trying to create money for shareholders. Like they were, they were truly worried about their employees and building a great culture. And they were truly worried. You know, speaking of net promoter, they were worried about their customers. And so, you know, I'd say, and I'd say a lot of people are in this boat now. They're balancing these three stakeholders, which is freaking hard work. Just, just balancing three <laughs> as a CEO. I actually think it's one of the hardest things you do. Maybe the hardest thing you do is balance the stakeholders because, right, there's trade-offs. It's like, do we make less money so we can pay the employees more, right? Do we, like, you know, do we make the employees do all this work that the customers want that they don't want to do, right? Like, so that trade-off is hard. Uh, where I saw the, uh, the industry at a high level failing is this idea of treating society as a stakeholder. So, you know, especially in the last, I'd say the last 10, 10 years, it's gotten particularly stressful for CEOs because you're barraged with, all of these societal issues that I, they sound important, you know, whether it's diversity or you know, diversity, inclusion, or the, and the environment. And like, literally you could have hundreds of things that a different faction of your employee base says, this is important. Uh, and there was no frame to operationalize that. Like, how do you deal with that? It's impossible. So the, so the fourth stakeholder framework is just, a, a, it's an operational playbook to treat society at large as a stakeholder, right? For measure, figure out what's important for your business, prioritize and measure, kind of, kind of like Net Promoter for customer. In fact, that was my inspiration, kind of the way Net Promoter takes the complexity of all of your customer issues and just gives you an engine. I wanted something for companies for the societal piece. So 
long answer, but that's that's kind of what the framework is. Going going back to your question, you know, how do you balance it? That you know, that's that's very hard, right? It's very hard because a lot of times, just like any other stakeholder, the things that you're doing that are societally impactful might be at odds with your shareholders or your or your customers, right? Uh, uh, you know, the the clear and probably you know, obvious example you know, over the last decade has been the social media companies as an industry, right? I would argue have absolutely neglected their response, their social responsibility to understand the impact of their technologies. Again, as an industry, you could, you could pick, you can pick on individual companies, but it's really the collective, right? They, they do not understand what their technology is doing to the world, to the psychology of people, to teens, to depression. And there are clear correlation signals, right? So they, they have a responsibility to go figure that out. Uh, and they haven't, they haven't, done their diligence from my perspective in the way that they should but yeah going back to your question you know for me it's Um, it's now at this point it's just ingrained in how i operate it's just in the same way that i i'm always thinking about well what's the dashboard for my customers for my employees like i think about what what is my business creating harm is it creating damage like and how do i mitigate that and so it's just part of my operating engine if that makes sense yeah no that makes 100 percent sense um Let's dive into, I know you're right now working remotely. So you're uh, normally you're in Silicon Valley, correct? That's right. That's right. I live out of, uh, yeah, the heart of Silicon Valley, basically. <laughs> and now you're in UK. Yeah. Um, so enjoying your time there. But during all this, um, and I know you're part of our network at Boards Eye, but you kind of took a break. And now you dived right back in and you got a new company, Emovid, which I would love for you to talk about because I think people need to know about it. I know you have a wait list right now. Yeah. Uh, but talk a little bit about that because it is, um, I, I, I love it. So oh, I started yeah. using it a little bit more today. So Excellent. Yeah. No, no, thank you, Bart. No, this is, you know, so, you know, so I was running Evite for seven, eight years and then went to go think, figure out what do I want to go do next? This, this, fourth, this fourth stakeholder framework was 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 instrumental right i wanted to do something that i could really point to as an example of look this is how you scale a business effectively while balancing all the stakeholders including society and it was clear to me you know two you know a little over two years ago that the the business arena that i needed to do this this in was around ai uh because you know we, we could have a whole separate discussion around like the the foundational change that AI is going to have on the society over the yeah. next 10 or 20 years. Um, I, you know, that's one of the keynotes I love to give is, you know, the business impact of AI. And I, I, I am on the end of the spectrum that says this is going to be one of the biggest things ever <laughs> in terms of behavioral change. <laughs> um, at the same time, right, it was clear to me, wow, this is going to have some of the most onerous, what I call second order impacts of businesses. Like we're going to start pushing technology out uh, and it might seem like it's doing good a good thing on one hand, but then on the other hand, like what are the downstream effects for the society and have we thought these through? Have we put the controls in? So, so what a Mo- with that as the background, what a Movid is at a, at a very high level, it's very simple. Um, a Movid is bringing AI enhanced video messaging into business. So video messaging, meaning not video conferencing real time, but video back and forth. And the AI enhancement piece comes in because, well, one of the reasons that people yeah, I would argue, you know, 99.9% of people listening to this have probably never sent a video message in the context of business before, right? No one has ever built the platform to enable that and make it work within business and make it professional. And so we're, you know, we're doing that. We've done that. Uh, and the AI, there, you know, the AI has a lot of different impacts within that experience, some of which are to make you feel comfortable with how the video looks, right? You know, we describe this as, hey, we, we want to put like a professional video shoot at your fingertips instantly. So, you know, I'm in a, I'm in a hotel room now, but I've, I've sent out probably, you know, 30 Emovid videos from my hotel room because I throw up a big, you know, a background, animated background with the Emovid logo and, you know, the, you know, adjust the lighting and I apply a tiny bit of, you know, algorithmic facial smoothing. And I'm like, wow, oh, it's like, it's basically like digital makeup. I'm like, okay, I feel good. I feel good about my, my business video that's going out. Um, so yeah, that, that's the product. It allows you to very quickly record a message. And then the, the coolest thing also, which nobody has done, is it, it allows for the back and forth, right? And, and you've seen this, Martin, and you know, and we've traded, right? So I can send, you, know, you can send anyone on the planet a message and they can instantly respond. They don't have to download anything. 
uh, there's basically zero friction. Uh, in a lot of ways, we uh, we leveraged a lot of the workflows of Evite um, in that Evite has a similar model, which is it's, it's like a cross-platform kind of agnostic tool. So, you know, no, no. So, so that's the product at a high level. The the value it brings is in some ways going straight to the st- fourth stakeholder um, dynamic. The value it brings is it's going to help people connect face-to-face in authentic ways. So the, the authentic communication that we're maintaining is so important. Right? If you get a message from a Mobid, you're like, that's Victor. I know that's Victor. We actually have a, 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 an authenticity seal that says, nope, that's him. That is, he might have applied a little bit of facial smoothing, but you can feel good. That's not a deep fake, right? That is him smiling or being goofy or whatever it is. And no AI. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, AI enhanced. Right, and but not AI. It, exactly, the video is authentic. Yes. Bingo, bingo. It's not that you know there are a bunch of these companies that are building things that are going to you know, create avatars that are going to try to fool you into thinking that's Victor or Martin speaking. Yeah. I'm like these, these. I was like these are horrible. Te- like, why are we building this right uh, and putting these out into market? Because uh, one thing I tell all CEOs is like, think about your business in the limit, in the limit of success. Like, what happens to the world? I'm like. In the limit of success where everyone's using fake avatars to communicate, I'm like, is that a, it's like, okay, if that's not a good world, then that means you have a second order impact that's not good somewhere in your model, right? You should really think about that. Um, so no, it's, it, it's, it's, it's really important. This, this need for authenticity, um, this defense of authenticity in the world is going to be, I think, one of the most important battles that get fought over the next 10 or 20 years as this wave of AI and, and fake communication flows through uh, and you know it's funny the the society is feeling it so uh, back uh, i think just last year it was 2023 or the miriam word of the year right so this is the dictionary where they track like where, where's the most energy it's is is authenticity because people are, are thinking like what what's going on with this ai like who's who's writing wait who's writing these emails is this even from victor right and so yeah authentic oh uh, yeah stay authentic stay human these are hashtags that um, that we'll be using in our marketing. Keep it human. <laughs> no, hundred percent. And I I, I want to add also you limit the message down to two minutes. So obviously, no one should be expecting receiving a video and sitting there listening to it for ten minutes trying to get through a video. Uh, but at the same time, if somebody doesn't want to watch the video, you also transcribe the video down into a text so you can read a text if you prefer reading and not listening. Um, but the two minutes I think is great because you can say quite a lot in two minutes that you probably will spend 10 minutes typing out. So it's a time saver. That That, that is exactly right. It's you know, it's so funny how much, I actually think you know, there's, there's these pockets of massive worldwide inefficiency that just bug me and email is yeah. one. So there's, there's about four and a half billion emails that are sent in business, the average person, and you got the numbers exactly right, Martin, like I, I think your intuition spot on. The average person spends about three to four hours in their email a day in business. And their average typing speed is around 30 to 40 minutes when you include the fact that they've got to, you've got to stop, you've got to compose, you've got to edit, right? The average speaking speed is 175 words. It's like 4x, 5x. Right. And so just by moving what, you know, instead of sitting there and spending 10 minutes typing that email and trying to get all the tone right, it's like, oh, do I have it right? Like with a Mobid, you click a button, you record a message in two minutes and you send it and you've just saved eight minutes. And that adds up insanely. I I save right now because we have a tracking system in the product about 10 hours a week, which is crazy. That's like 25 percent of a week have come back to me. Right. And it's more emotive, right? The, the the communication itself is more impactful because it comes to your point. So uh, you know, it's, it's funny we call ourselves a video messaging platform, but this was so critical to cracking this open for business. The recipient of the video message gets the video, the audio, an AI summary. We just added literally today the AI summary of the action items and requests, a full text transcript which is localizable in sixty languages. And so it's funny. You know, people are people ask me like, well, do you care if they don't watch the video. I'm like, no, no, that's the design, right? The, the design is to, to give the speed of the sender and all the emotion. And now the recipient gets to determine, oh, is this a message that I want to scan, read? Do I need to see the emotion? Do I want to hear? And it's funny, in my own behavior, when I'm getting messages, I probably I probably read the transcript of half. And then there's half where I say, God, I really want to, I want, I really want to hear Martin's voice because this is like an important message, right? It's so annoying. <laughs> yeah, no, it's like, or it's like, oh, no, it's like, yeah. 
is that what he really means? Is he mad when he says that? Let, let me listen to it, right? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, yeah no, it's... And that's, that's sorry, but that's so true. You just brought up something I didn't even think about because, I mean, text messages, you know, are, are famous for starting arguments because you can't yes. hear the emotions when you're reading stuff. Yes. So you could be just saying something, but it came across on the other side totally different. Yeah. So yeah, hearing it is game changer and then also seeing a facial expression is a game changer so i uh, yeah, you're on, you're on track and i love the fact that you're translating uh obviously the text not the video mm -hmm. yet yeah but you're translating which is you know yes we can all use google translate and copy and paste but this simplifies it it's right there yeah no it's it's, it's it's crazy because it's you know there's support for 60 languages you could you can literally now Talk to anyone in the world and they can talk back and you can just go back and forth. It's like, yeah. And, and it's it, going back to this AI enhanced, a bunch of these things are all because of the massive improvement in AI services that are available. Right. So I'll, I'll call out something incredible. It seems incredibly simple when you describe it to someone, which is, can you take a video, get a transcript and, and create a short succinct summary that's accurate of what that video is about? That was an impossible problem before the large language models. There is no coder on the planet that could have could have done that. And that is so critical to the experience that we're creating because, again, you want to be able to get a message and say, like, oh, what's this about? Right. If you know, pre the LLMs, you would have gotten a, you know, even a two minute video. And it was like, oh, I, I, you know, do I want to deal with this? And so translation, another example, right, an AI based service, right, calling out action items which is so cool. We just launched this today. Like, you know, it, so you get the message like, oh, here's the three things that Martin's asking about. Like, it's just, so it's, it's synthesizing it for you, taking a lot of that work out, but still keeping it authentic. And all, all of those things were impossible before, uh, you know, in the last 18, possible over the 18, last 18 months, basically. That's awesome. I'm looking to look, looking forward to your hundred uh, percent launch of the product. Super exciting. Uh, while you're in UK, uh, are you traveling anywhere? Have you visited any other country? Yeah, so it's funny. I'm, I'm working out of the UK. That I, I just tacked this on to our family trip. So um, our family went to, <laughs> um, we were in uh, Germany. So we were actually Amsterdam, Hamburg, and Berlin. And then uh, my, uh, my youngest daughter had a camp in England. And so instead of flying back and forth and back and forth, I just decided I might as well just. So yeah, no, I've hit like four completely random towns in the south of uk like a, a beautiful roman town called bath i'd never even heard of i was like oh my god it was gorgeous <laughs> roman ruin like beautiful roman ruins so no no it's 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 been super fun it's one of the one of the awesome that's things awesome. about being able to you know work remotely and having a distributed team yeah that's awesome well i hope you enjoy the rest of your trip and uh i guess we'll uh chat soon but uh have a good trip back to us and uh next time you're in vegas let me know We'll connect in person. We'll take the video to a next level. Oh, absolutely. I love Vegas. Vegas is one of my favorites. Vegas is the, so it's funny. I have all these weird predictions. I actually predict that Vegas is going to be the future of the world. Meaning, again, not next year, but at some point in time, right? When this AI will have massive productivity gains. And we're basically, as a, as a human species, we're going to be in a world where we have a whole bunch of discretionary time. And I'm like, what do you do when you have that? It's like, you want good food. You're going to want something that's like an increment of award system like gambling right entertainment entertainment be, sports sports no no sports. sports i was like so it's like i, I think I, I think the world kind of turns into vegas over time got a movie studio coming <laughs> sony sony sponsoring it with mark wolf i mean oh, nice. mark Wahlberg. yeah he pushed it and sony's behind it so they're going to start uh, breaking ground soon so yeah you're right there's a lot of crazy things good things yeah. going on in vegas and Gambling is just going to be one of those things that never goes away. Yeah. But there's a lot more to Vegas yeah. than just gambling. Yeah, that's and sure. the world's going to be way hotter. It's going to be like Vegas. <laughs> yeah, it'll be normal. <laughs> and it's only hot for three months, three and a half months. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Victor, so much for joining me. All right, no, 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 uh, my pleasure. Uh, such a treat. And we'll talk to you soon. Bye -bye. Thank you for tuning in to Leadership Talks. Don't forget to subscribe for more insightful conversations with industry leaders. Your support means a lot to us.